I'm Edward October, and this is A Nefarious Nightmare. This podcast contains foul language and discussions of violence. Additional trigger warnings will be posted as needed in the show notes. Listener discretion is advised. Today we're going to discuss something a little bit different, but highly relevant. We aim to wake everyone we can up to police brutality. What's happened to the people that we talk about is a crime and a senseless one at that. We want to drive the point home that even after the outrage that occurred during the murder of George Floyd in 2020, even to this day, black men and women are being murdered for no reason by law enforcement. We do not believe all law enforcement to be bad people, but it's unfortunate that many of them do indeed seem to target people of color. It has to stop. With that, I'm Amanda Cronin. And I'm Courtney Fenner. And A Nefarious Nightmare presents Enough is Enough, The Senseless Killings of Tatiana Jefferson and Botham Jean. This episode highlights Botham Jean and a Tatiana Jefferson, but it's about more than just these two beautiful souls. It is unfortunate that many people of color, specifically black men, women, and even children, have been on the receiving end of unjustified killings and police brutality. We all by now have been familiar with the George Floyd protests that occurred back in 2020. Movements across the United States started being born and calling attention to racism and police brutality. Oftentimes, the people who are subject to such brutality are simply driving, shopping, sleeping, eating, breathing, working, existing while being black. And unfortunately, even though there is no law that we know of that says it's a crime to be a different shade of the rainbow than anyone else, it seems that based on the statistics, there's some unwritten rule within law enforcement to murder people of color. Is this a power thing? More unfortunately, racism? Is it both? Do the two things tie together in some kind of weapon to go against the rest of the world? Some kind of method to continue to try to quote unquote whitewash the United States so that maybe if we were visited by aliens or something, we would be seen as different? Why is it that we all hate the evil and hatred connected to white robes so much, but we continue to try to cloak our country in one? And then, when you do such, you inadvertently paint it red with blood. But I guess that's alright, because you can just bleach it later? In case you aren't gathering what we're trying to say, racism is prevalent in the United States and doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. But we all have to stand together and fight it. We have to raise awareness to it and call people in positions of power out. There are better ways of reprimanding an actual criminal, which by the way, the people we discussed today were not criminals, but regardless, to murder a human being for no justified reason has got to end. This is just my personal opinion, but... If you want to take your hatred out on someone, there's a full list of sexual assailants and pedophiles that continuously get swept under the rug. But instead, you choose to direct that hatred towards people of color who aren't even doing anything wrong. And in nearly all cases, even if they were involved in illegal activity, they aren't hurting anyone. But pedophiles and rapists are ruining entire childhoods and livelihoods, stealing innocence and getting away with it? How does that even make any fucking sense? Statistics show that the trend of fatal police shootings are only increasing, even after the George Floyd protest. Are we really that fucking tone deaf that change isn't occurring? As of 2022, a total of 787 civilians were shot, and 73 of them are black. In 2021, 1,055 fatal police shootings, and in 2020, 1,020 
the rate of fatal shootings of black men and women were much higher than any other ethnicity, being 41 fatal shootings per million as of September this year. We spoke to our friend Sonia Cohen, who, by the way, helped our research on the last episode about Robert B. Um, And she took a look at some of today's notes and had something I felt was vital to this episode to say. She remembered a case where a local man was doing a food delivery service and he was shot after a routine traffic stop. He did try to run from the cops, but I want to say something. It is often that black men and women are in such a state of fear that whenever they're pulled over, that fight or flight does kick in. This person she talks about likely knew of the police brutality that occurs, even when the person is compliant. So she goes on to say, quote, Jalen Walker, Jalen Walker, Jalen Walker. In the time it took us to say his name, it took Akron Police Department the same amount of time to take his life. Monday, June 22nd of 2022, Jalen Walker was door dashing when Akron PD stopped him during a routine traffic stop. Jalen was unarmed, no criminal background, and running away from police when shots were fired. Jalen was shot at approximately 60 times. The coroner determined that 46 shot of the 60 fired hit Jalen, but he wasn't sure which of the shots fired was the shot that killed him. All eight officers involved in the shooting were placed on administrative leave. Jalen Walker's aunt, who he called his Aunt Minnie, but her name is Lawana Walker Dawkins, she goes on to say, quote, I know a lot of people like to say that their loved ones are good, but it's the truth. We love Jalen. He's my skinny little nephew and we miss him. We just want some answers. End quote. Today, we choose to tell you about Botham Jean and Atatiana Jefferson, both of which were at home when they were murdered. What were they doing wrong? Nothing. Nothing at all. But in some eyes, they merely existed. So first, we're going to discuss what happened to Atatiana Jefferson. She was born November 28th, 1990. Some sources say Dallas, Texas, but it's not exactly clear. It has been noted that she lived in North Dallas for a time, attending Lake Highlands High School, and also grew up in the Oak Cliff neighborhood. Her family lovingly referred to her as Tay, so every now and again, you'll likely hear us quote sources referring to her as either Atatiana or Tay. Growing up, Atatiana was intelligent and naturally inquisitive. She cared deeply for her family and also loved playing video games. It's been noted that she would often play video games with her nephew due to it teaching STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and math. And she loved everything about science. It would be a form of encouragement that stayed with her nephew, Zion, for life. Atatiana went to Lake Highlands High School in North Dallas and played clarinet and band. She also was noted to be kind to those who were outcasts, those who didn't fit in. One of her classmates by the name of Cheryl Calhoun even stated, quote, there were people who didn't fit in and she was always very kind to them, end quote. And I've noticed throughout all the cases that we cover that this personality type is very prevalent in victims of murder. It doesn't even matter if the victim was known by the offender, just a weird coincidence that all victims and survivors seem to have the similar personality type. She had an older sister, Ashley Carr, who remembered her for her honor, integrity, and commitment. But Tatiana was very close with and dedicated to her family, even was a caregiver to her nephew while his mother went into surgery. She's remembered as being a loving aunt who adored her nephews. Her sister quoted as saying, quote, The relationship she has with my sons is indescribable. Sometimes people think they're her kids and not mine. Atatiana went on to get her bachelor's in biology degree after graduating in 2014 from Xavier University of Louisiana and was working in the field of human resources. She had moved to Fort Worth about 45 minutes to an hour away from Dallas, Texas to care for her mom who was ill at the time. One very early Saturday morning after 2 a.m., October 12th, 2019, she and her nephew were still awake at her home playing video games. Tatiana lived in a home on the 1200 block of Allen Avenue in Fort Worth, which is near I-35 and also very close to John Peter Smith Hospital. This area, at the very least, surrounding neighborhoods haven't been known to be particularly safe, having been someone that lived there myself for a brief time, and I can attest to that one. 
but this particular neighborhood over on Allen Avenue was known for being tight-knit, and everyone pretty much knew each other, or at the very least, knew of each other. And that's important because everyone would watch over each other, so it's no surprise that a neighbor was alarmed to see Tatiana's door open and felt compelled to call the non-emergency police dispatch for a simple welfare check. At around 2.25 a.m. on the phone, the neighbor stated that it was strange that the door was open at all and noted that both vehicles were still in the driveway and that his neighbor is usually there, but they never leave the door open. And to be fair, it is a little alarming to see a door of a neighbor open like that late at night and their cars are still there. 23 seconds later, police were dispatched and three minutes later, the first unit is on the scene. In an eerie set of events, looking at the body cam footage that Fort Worth Police Department released, you notice an officer start at the front door. There are lights on, he checks it out and starts to move around to the back of the home. It goes dark for a second and then, I could be mistaken, but it looked like he had a gun drawn. You see him move up towards a back area, what looks like to be a back patio that's dimly lit and I believe there's a garage door that's at her neighbor's yard, but it's so dimly lit that it's almost hard to tell. But then you hear whispering as they approach the door of the wooden fence and open it. Meanwhile, as Atatiana and Zion are playing video games, Atatiana hears some noises in her backyard. She's of course alarmed and grabs a handgun, which is absolutely warranted in this kind of situation. She wanted to be ready to protect herself and her nephew. So as she is armed, she goes to take a look to see what on earth is happening. There shouldn't be those strange noises this early in the morning directly in her backyard. It's believed that Zion followed behind Atatiana to see what was going on, but she knew to make him stay back. Atatiana then reaches the window in her rear portion of her home facing the backyard and comes face to face with a man who, without identifying himself, says, put your hands up, show me your hands, and then immediately shoots. According to her nephew, she already had her own gun drawn when she was shot. This was her exercising her right to bear arms within her own home, should there be an intruder or something sinister to occur. Atatiana was pronounced dead on the scene at 3.05 a.m. Atatiana Jefferson was shot in her own home and for no reason, other than existing in her home. Her nephew was left physically unharmed, but surely he's traumatized for the rest of his life. At the time of writing this, a trial was set to be less than four months away. The officer who shot her, Aaron Dean, resigned from his position before he could even be fired for violating departmental policies on use of force, de-escalation, and unprofessional conduct, among other things. It's noted that the termination paperwork was already in progress, reflecting a dishonorable discharge. Dean has not had any priors and had been noted as extremely uncooperative, callous, and refusing to answer questions, which is evident if you look back at all of the news footage. The body cam footage will be included in the show notes, but watch it with caution because it is disturbing after you know all of this. How terrified must Tatiana have been in the first place? I can only describe it as eerie and also, if I'm honest, enraging because this was a woman who was minding her own business playing video games with her nephew. Update on Dean. As of today, Dean has managed to avoid multiple trial dates. His first trial date was set to be in January, then rescheduled for May, then June, currently now scheduled for a murder trial in December. These delays resulted for multiple reasons, one being that Dean's defense team fought a successful fight to kick the original judge off the trial. He was removed for, quote unquote, bias and being overly hostile. This is uncertain time, but for the sake of Atatiana and her family, we have to remain hopeful that justice will be served. Other reasons for the date changes are scheduling conflicts, Jury selection is now set to begin on November 28th of this year, with the trial to begin on December 5th. Despite the frustration of all these setbacks, we can hope that the trial in December does stick to schedule and that Atatiana's family can obtain justice and closure. A little over a year prior, and 45 minutes or so away from Fort Worth, 26-year-old Botham Jean was in his apartment minding his own business. 
It was the night of September 6, 2018. Botham Jean was born September 28, 1991 in Castries, St. Lucia. Castries being the largest city in St. Lucia, which is a Caribbean island country, and his favorite color was red. He was lovingly referred to as Bo. Ten years younger than his sister, Alyssa, and ten years older than his brother, Brant Jean. He's remembered as someone who was very self-assured and dedicated to his relationship with God, even requesting to be baptized at the young age of eight. His parents had told him no, only for him to go back a year later with the same request. And then again, another year later, finally getting his request at the age of 10, which really speaks to his persistence and dedication. He then began preaching in his early teens, being remembered as someone who was a perfectionist, wasn't forced to do anything he himself wouldn't do, knowing what he wanted, and always had a plan or even a proposal. He's even remembered as someone who, if he didn't like something, he'd try to fix it. His mother remembers that he didn't like the way his church choir sang, so he stepped up and taught them, even arranging the singers by sopranos, altos, bass, and tenor. And he becomes an adult at the age of 19, attending a private Christian school by the name of Harding University in Saracy, Arkansas. He often returned to St. Lucia to do volunteer work with at-risk youth or the St. Lucia Orphanage. Fast forward again to September 6, 2018. By this time, Botham Jean is an accountant and living a good life and minding his own business. Amber Geiger, after finishing what would be an extended shift on duty as a police officer, claimed to have thought she parked on the wrong floor, his being the fourth and hers being the third, walks into his apartment, located directly above her own, and shoots him two times. Botham Jean was pronounced dead at a nearby hospital sometime after 10 p.m. when she makes her 911 call. In her testimony, she said that she was off duty but still in uniform and had mistakenly entered his unit. She believed Jean was a burglar and shot him in the chest, claiming that she feared for her safety. Amber Geiger was then arrested on September 9th after a warrant was executed and she had been identified. During the sentencing, the attorneys say that she was heard saying, quote, let me in the night of the shooting. Another witness said they heard a man after the shooting exclaim, Oh my God, why did you do that? There were several issues with search warrants and backlash to its details, and then investigators sought the video from the doorbell camera. Then, on September 24th, Amber Geiger was then fired. A month later, a federal lawsuit is filed by the Jean family. A month after that, the grand jury convened and then Amber Geiger is indicted five days later on November 30th on murder. September 23rd, the following year, the trial begins. Several times, Amber Geiger holding on to her claims that she thought it was her apartment, saying, quote, I'm fucked. I thought it was my apartment, end quote, or, quote, I'm going to lose my job, end quote. The trial lasted until October 1st, and the verdict was guilty. A day later, she was sentenced to 10 years. Prosecutors had originally asked jurors to sentence Geiger to at least 28 years, which was noted to be considered symbolic because if Botham were still alive, he would have recently, to that point, just turned 28. There had been rumors of an affair between Botham and Amber Geiger that were absolutely untrue, and revelations were made that she shared racist and offensive texts and social media posts. One very memorable testimony comes from Botham's brother, Brant Jean. He said, quote, If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I personally want the best for you. I wasn't even going to say this before my family, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what Botham would want you to do. To give your life to Christ. End quote. Brant Jean then requested to hug Amber Geiger and they allowed it. He then walked over to her and embraced her for almost a full minute. A few things to note here. We mentioned earlier that Botham's favorite color was red. He would differentiate his own apartment from others by laying a bright red mat in front of his front door. There was a memorial held in Botham's honor where everyone would wear red ties or other items of clothing to honor his memory. Update on Amber Geiger. She filed an appeal, and while two judges wrote, 
dissenting opinions on this, the rest of the court voted against even hearing her appeal. It's been mentioned that it's likely she's exhausted all of her appeal avenues. She is set to continue her 10-year sentence, but is up for parole in 2024. We have all, not just us, but every living person, been asked to remember their names, to say their names. There are a ton of names. I stopped counting at about 200. But we do want to mention quite a few victims of police brutality here. Many of these people were murdered simply while they were shopping, minding their own business. The list of POC murdered by police includes Dante Wright, 20 years old. Andre Hill, 47. Manuel Ellis, 33 years old. Rayshard Brooks, 27. Daniel Prude, 41 years old. Keyshawn Thomas. 27. George Floyd, 46 years old. Breonna Taylor, 26. Atatiana Jefferson, 28 years old. Aurora Rosser, 40. Christopher Kelly, 38 years old. Stefan Clark, 22. Dante Cottrell, 51 years old. Catherine Massey, 72. Botham Jean, 26 years old. Philandro Castile, 32. Alton Sterling, 37 years old. Hayward Patterson, 67. Freddie Gray, 25 years old. Ruth Whitfield, 86. Janisha Fonville, 20 years old. Jalen Walker, 25. Eric Garner, 43 years old. Michelle Cusso, 50. Akai Gurley, 28 years old. Pearl Young, 77. Gabriela Navarez, 22 years old. Tamir Rice, 12. Andre McNeil, 53 years old. Michael Brown, 18. Tanisha Anderson, 37 years old. Many of these people were unarmed and peaceful. None of their deaths were necessary. These are just a few POC that have been murdered by police brutality. There is a full list in our Wikipedia source as well as our Say Every Name source in the show notes. What happened to George Floyd really started to wake people up to what is happening to POC in the United States. It's an alarming thing to see that this is still happening. We recognize that there are some law enforcement that will do the right thing, but the message here is that a lot of abuse of power and racism is staggering. We hope everybody listening will have taken away some kind of wisdom from this because People of color are bees. They are resilient, strong, but vulnerable. Bees are necessary for life. Bees are responsible for everything we consume today. We have got to protect the bees at all costs. So be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Original intro music by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional music provided by Epidemic Sound. This podcast was researched, scripted, and produced by Amanda Cronin and Courtney Finner. A Nefarious Nightmare is a Cloud 10 I Heart podcast. Managed by... A Nefarious Nightmare, Sim Sarna, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. Thank you again for listening, and be vigilant.